You're listening to the world's smartest podcast network. Welcome back to another episode of Majoring in Everything. We're coming in hot, finally, with a bonus episode. This is yet another very exciting world's smartest podcast network roundtable. And I'm very excited to share it with you. I always enjoy getting together with my fellow world's smartest podcast hosts. So we're rounding up the, the latest news and giving our most sophisticated takes on it ever. So hopefully you enjoy. And I did want to apologize for the delay in the other episodes. They are coming up and I have a couple more episodes for you for season one. There are going to be 10 total and we have some really fantastic guests that I can't wait to share with you. So stay tuned for those. And thank you so much for listening and for your patience. Enjoy. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another World's Smartest Podcast Network Roundtable. We are here to explain the entire world with your fellow World's Smartest Podcast Network hosts. I'm Andrea Jones-Roy. Joining me today, we have Andrew Heaton from The Political Orphanage. Heaton, how are you? Good. Howdy. Howdy. Nice to see you. And we have our two co-hosts from the Lost in America podcast, Michael Ira Kaplan. What's going on? Captain Mike. Shalom. Captain Mike. How, how you doing? doing? Good. How are All you? All right. And Turner Sparks coming in from Tor. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you all doing? Awesome. Thank you. For can I can I change my howdy to a shalom? I like that. I, yeah. I want to do I, I shalom as well. Shalom, Mike. You're my favorite uh, honorary Jew, so you can use. Thank that, you yes. very much. I take it. I keep that. Yeah. Uh, there's a little card in my wallet. Uh, okay, good. I was going to say I don't know if that's allowed if you don't have the card. So I like I can't say shalom because Mike hasn't given me a card. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll Perfect. we'll talk later. I'm gonna have, all right. get to say ch- chayim or something. Then I'll, then I'll chayim. Well, chayim. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to come in with some working. assalamu alaikum. Does that immediately mm, rip up any card I might have That's the wrong. You got that backwards. There it is. Yeah. All right. All assalamu right. Well, alaikum. we have uh, all the news in the world to discuss this week for this roundtable or this month. I don't know how often we do these things, but we're going to talk about the world's going on. Uh, I am going to talk about the big one in the news today. So I wanted to talk about the Supreme Court nominations. Of course, it's hard to, hard to imagine a roundtable without such a thing. And my main thoughts about this, I'm curious what you guys think. My main thoughts are... I know almost nothing about the Supreme Court. I know for sure I should care a lot more about the Supreme Court, given it's the only like lifetime appointments in the country besides faculty and faculty don't do anything. And I know that there's a lot of stuff that people are about to debate like or are, are debating like abortion and all these things that I really care about. And yet I cannot bring myself to get involved in or pay attention to the Supreme Court. I don't know any of the court members' names. I know that Clarence Thomas is someone that people don't like. I wasn't even sure he was a Republican until the news came out about what his wife was doing. <laughs> really? And I was like, wait, that does shows he agree your with age. that? This is what's going on, right? Oh, but yes. I wanted to talk about, I say all of that to say that I've still managed to conclude after the hearings that have been going on this week that the treatment for the Supreme Court uh, nominee, Justin uh, Jackson, mm-hmm. are terrible. My okay. understanding from the sound clips that have made their way to me, who cares almost as little about this heat and as you do about sports, mm-hmm. I can tell that it's a complete <laughs> nightmare over there. I, I see the Ted Cruz ranting. I see him holding the anti-racist baby book. I heard that that book is now trending on Amazon and everyone's buying it. But Shut my up. main takeaway is that these confirmation hearings are complete garbage. They're a waste yeah. of everybody's time. And it's all the racism and sexism and everything else you could ever imagine because this is a Harvard lawyer who's clerked for all these famous people. And I barely even know what clerked means. But it <laughs> seems like she's a very accomplished candidate and that these questions that she's being asked have nothing to do with being a Supreme Court justice. So, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. So question for you all, are these hearings worth having? What a, what a huge amount of attention we've all put into these things this week. I think that they we should abs- the American people should absolutely have transcripts available to them of these ridiculous show trials yep. because transparency is important. I do not think they should be televised. That's the key because they end uh. up becoming a uh, just a mouthpiece for a bunch of blowhards, all of whom are mm-hmm. planning to run for president, yep. to collect sound bites and throw it to the base. And the the one thing I do like about these, and I I think that, and by the way, I, when I say this, this applies to every Supreme Court nominee hearing that I've seen in the last five years. So this is this is not me just talking about Jackson. This is me talking about Gorsuch. This is me talking about Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, Barrett. Um, I I like that America's beginning to remember that we don't have to think in terms of Republican versus Democrat. We can also think in terms of normal humans versus egg-sucking politicians. <laughs> because I hate Congress as an institution yeah. every time this happens. And it because Group A 
will will go, hey, this is our nominee. You know, what an honor. We want to bring you in. Oh, you're such a smart person. And then group B will be like, uh, yes or no, have you diddled children? Yes or no? Like, like, and it's right. and they all do it, and it's horrible. And I, right. I, I, I remembered my inner roots of just how much I despise politicians as a subspecies. Yeah. And, and I'm very much at that state right now. Well, and just to add on that, there's a lot of hypotheticals going around, at least the latest clip that I saw right before we started recording was about this, right? Where Ted Cruz or someone comes on and says, well, what if this person diddled children and then he was yeah. also a black immigrant? What would yeah. you do that? And, and rightly, the, the you know, uh, Jackson was like, that's not a real situation, and what? judges don't weigh in on fake situations. It's so. not. It, that's not just it. It's not just that, that they're giving them, uh, giving her fake situations. It's that they're trying to entrap her in policy discussions yes. that they know she can't answer. Right. So, like to Jackson's credit, and and for anybody that hasn't heard me go off on my judicial rant before, Here there's no such thing as conservative jurisprudence and liberal jurisprudence. There's originalism and living constitutionalism. They're correlated. They are not the same thing. Judge Jackson has answered all of her questions from the perspective of a textualist. That is to say, she is saying consistently throughout these hearings that it is her job to interpret the Constitution as written, not mm. to infer how she wishes for it to be written, which is very much the log line of all Republicans. And the the position that she keeps taking, as she should be doing, is when, when they ask her, what should the sentencing be for uh, child porn? Because that comes up all the time. Somebody that's convicted of child porn, how long should we put them in prison? And she says again and again, as a judge, it is not my job to write the policy for this. That's the job of Congress. It's my job to interpret what Congress has written and apply it to the situation. And were she to weigh in on all of these things, then you could very easily spin around and go, well, this is a judicial activist. Listen to her. She wants she wants to do X, Y, and Z. So they're 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 putting her in positions they know she can't answer anyway. Heaton, Turner, I forgot define you said originalist. Said. I yes, wanted sir. I wanted to just congratulate Charming. Heaton on using the British Z. Yeah. As it. opposed to Z. He's a real he's My, a real okay. I'm very pretentious when it comes to the alphabet. That's a very uh, all of, deliberate. All of my, I also have one of those letters with an umlaut over it, a little U with two dots over sure. it that I use when I write certain <laughs> Do things. Do you draw Can the I jump in here? line through the Z? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, all right, I Turner, think, what do you got? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I haven't watched a second of this, right. and I would be interested to know what the ratings are. I feel like they're below <laughs> zero. <laughs> they're no yeah. Kavanaugh. Because Here's like the worse issue. than the Olympics, even. It's yeah. with the because it's it's like watching season twenty nine of Law and Order. Like we all know what's going to happen. It's the same episode week after week after week. They're going Ice T is going to find a dead body, and then they're going to be like, "Whoa, who did it?" And then they're going to spend the rest of the time, and then they're going to figure out that it was you know the guest host, the guy who you've seen. Oh, whoa, he's in here for one episode. I wonder if he's the killer. You know, and. Yeah. It's the same with this. It's like we, as as Heaton said, we all know one side's gonna be like this is the best person ever, and the other person's gonna be like they're a rapist, and then yeah. we're gonna figure it out. And then at some point, Cory Booker's gonna launch his presidential campaign. Cory yeah. Booker's gonna cry. Uh, you're gonna yeah. have somebody else be self righteous and angry. Yeah, yeah. And it's always the same. And I don't watch it, and I'm proud that I haven't watched <laughs> a single second of it. And that's my WSBN, take. folks. Here well, it is. That's well, basically how I feel point. about the State of the Union address. I just oh, I don't yeah, watch I it do or it. comment on it anymore. I don't want to give it any attention. There's just I so can't. much more interesting stuff that's happening in the world right now. Right. Yeah. Well, so, also, right. Which to me feels like they shouldn't, I think, Heaton, you're right. Like, you shouldn't televise it. It shouldn't, just vote. And if there's such a dispute, maybe we can have a conversation. The I like thing, that idea a lot. I like that idea. Yeah. Because there are, obviously, as Andrea, as you said, it is important to be happening. It's just that the, sh the song and dance is it's right. the same beats yeah. every time. Can I say one thing before Kaplan yeah. jumps in here? Um, yeah. I didn't know until like two weeks ago that these Supreme Court people could retire. I thought you were... <laughs> Wait, you have hold a choice. on. You, have no you thought choice. like Justice Justice Breyer was like limping to the Supreme Court every yes. day. It was like, please let me. They've got a cattle prod behind him. They're like, they God like, damn it, make another ruling. Death to you part. Yeah, yeah. yeah they were like, this person's retired. I'm like, I didn't know you could retire. I thought it was till you died. You and thought then, this was like the papacy? I mean, <laughs> if you look at RBG and and she some of the others, did. well, that's yeah, no, true. no, Andrea. But that's where I'm going. Is that yeah. then that uh, th these people say Ruth Bader Ginsburg's a hero. She's yeah. a villain. What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> she should have left during the Obama administration if yep. she really cared about her party or whatever. I don't know if she's supposed to have a party, but we all know she did. If she really cares, she should have left eight years earlier and and or 
four, three years earlier, and they could have replaced her with somebody they wanted. But no, and yeah. uh, also, so yeah, she, she wanted to go tell her dad hero. how. At what what level is your ego that you need to be yeah. on like on a deadbed? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna swing for the dead lady. Here's what I think: if oh, if justices truly are being nonpartisan as they all claim to be, then that should not be a consideration. If if I am going to claim that I am not acting, yeah, but as we a know she on the wasn't. Court, Right. right. And her, then, she then, made then, some then, then her, then her consideration right. should not have been leaving while there was a Democrat or Republican in office. Like if, if it you, shouldn't have been like, You're not dealing with reality. She RPG yeah. books to sell. She needs to be relevant. I, I think so. I am the only person in America who's not a federal judge who thinks federal judges actually do what they say. Uh, yeah. in, in part because our Delusional. congressmen are so shitty, Delusional. we infer that the other branches are. But that I have fair. two Cap, things Cap, what happen. do you think about all well, this? Well, there's two things. One, talking, I agree, the TV, no TV courtroom would be great, TVs yeah. in the courtroom because, or in the Congress, because, like, these people in Congress are all idiots. They all went to law school, but they're all, like, low-tier lawyers. Right. And they want to <laughs> seem smart, and they're dealing with actual, no matter what party they're on, all these Supreme Court justice nominees are, like, really smart, and they want to seem smart in front of them, and they always, they just get shot down. That's one, but the, the biggest thing is, the, change, the way this has changed is when we were younger, I remember, because I was a loser who actually paid attention when I was younger, you didn't always know where they stood on everything. So they, they, the Republicans are always trying to figure out if someone was pro-choice or pro if they get rid of abortion, basically. That was the big issue, always. And they didn't have a paper trail. So it was actually interesting because it was trying to get you. It was, they would always try to ask questions, like, to try to see on one case if, oh, wait, they are pro-life. If your husband was yeah. pregnant, Exactly. Would <laughs> they would have these hypotheticals. And then, like, they, like George Bush the senior actually appointed a liberal judge, Souter, because, like, they screwed up. He, like, read the single. The winking went wrong or something. And they got the... So that, that now it's, that never happens anymore. Now we know. Everyone's either a liberal. They're all, like... They, like, we know what they're going to rule on 95% of the cases, really. And the interesting ones are the ones who don't rule that way. And I understand that Jackson, uh, the, the libertarians, kind of like that she's good on civil liberties. So she might actually not rule as much to the left as uh, Kagan and Sotomayor and Brian. Yeah, so I... I'm going to agree and disagree. I'm going to disagree with you, Kaplan, on all these people are stupid uh, in that I don't think that they're acting the way that they're acting in congressional hearings because they're stupid. I think they're acting the way they're acting because they're narcissists and well, they're very true. cynical. That goes, yeah. They're very, very <laughs> cynical about their, their dumbass voters who elected them. I guess they're justified in that because they do keep getting elected. But Well, Ted Cruz, like I think that applies to, right? But he's, Ted, he's well. So what, what Ted Cruz is this is this is a really whenever you're watching these hearings, whenever you see people going on self righteous tirades about something that doesn't appear to be about the, the the nominee, that's because they don't have anything on the nominee, but they still want to slop red meat at their idiot constituents. And the same thing happens with Democrats. So this time around, what the Republicans are doing is like, I don't have anything on her. She's pretty competent. We've already approved her three friggin' times to the judiciary. So I don't she went know. to better it's, law schools than we did. You know, see, yeah, say, say, yeah. So, let's just like, we all hate child porn, right? Let's just make up stuff about child porn, which that, that's been a whole thing. And for anybody that's unfamiliar with what's going on there, my understanding is basically um, uh, Ted Cruz and other people go, you know, the prosecutor recommended that that you give 300 years to somebody guilty of, of child porn, but you only go gave 180 years. So you like child Soft porn people? Kitty porn. Like, for, first of all, no federal judge is consistently giving the the maximum sentence. There, there's you're, you're given an allotted sentence by Congress. I don't know what it is. Let's say 10 years to 80 years. The judge has discretion within those years. No one ever consistently gives them all of them, nor should they for this reason. If I'm a federal judge and I have person A who diddles children and person B who has a picture of it, I'm going to give person B less of a sentence than the person diddling children. And like, that's what's going on here. But the point of not, none of this actually has to do with that. So it's you're just, saying you like child pornography. Yeah, exactly. I'm remembering this when exactly. he's nominated yeah. for the Supreme Court one day. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, I am now, I will officially ask you to step down as the yeah. host of your <laughs> podcast and Kaplan and I will take over your show. Yeah. Let's Damn get it. Canceled. Okay. Yeah. And we welcome, right. we want all, all right, your audience talk. to stick around. Let's talk about other grim news. The last thing I'm going to say on this is I read something on, on my way into this roundtable that we didn't do these confirmation hearings until Brandeis. And so, Cap, if you want to speak on behalf of all your people, the argument Wait, Are you there saying is we didn't do it because until, until we had a Jew? Is that a real yeah, thing? Yeah, it was really anti-Semitic. Slash, I mean, that's the speculation, <laughs> right? It could also be a million other things. But the argument, and, and Heaton, you can weigh in if you want to, if you can produce the card. But I, I think we should have Jews on the court. 
Oh, good. I, mean, I, yeah. I see anti-Semitism everywhere, and I yeah. somehow this is a hole in my history. I didn't know about. <laughs> well, there this. you go. <laughs> I missed that is true. The <laughs> amount of times on our podcast that like some there'll be like something in the news, and Kaplan's like, "Oh, it's clearly anti-Semitic." I'm like, "Really? I had no idea." Yeah. I mean, yeah. apparently, you know, it is. saying "Hail Hitler" is anti-Semitic, Turner. I'm sorry. Stop. Well, saying if, it. if I if I can swing in one thing, Kaplan, I do think you're right. I do think that uh, that Jackson is going to be a kind of Souter or Kennedy type character, uh, ba- based on her. What I've seen, I've seen about two hours of the hearings, maybe three hours of the hearings. She appears to be a textualist, which which is not like, like does not strike me as a judicial activist. She's also, her background is that of a, of a defense attorney, which is somebody that's generally opposed to government as opposed to a prosecutor. Wait, that's what um, makes her interesting, right? We haven't had a defense and so attorney. She, and exactly. Yeah. And she's also like more inclined towards sentencing reform. So for that reason, I don't, I, I think she's going to be a lot more of a wild card than anybody anticipates. And it would not surprise me if she's a little bit more like Gorsuch, where it's like, she, yes, she's appointed by president of this particular party, but ends up swinging with the other one on different issues. So I think she's going to be interesting to watch. But I think her her credibility as a judge is really not uh, up for debate, and and all the grandstanding is just red meat for sound bites to run for president later. The only good thing Wild that came card. out of it is all those tweets that are like, "Well, she's not talking about how much she loves beer." So there's that. <laughs> all right, Turner, you're talk. Let's talk about uh, all the chaos going on in Russia. Is that okay? Are we good going to that, yeah. <laughs> let's what do, you do got? it. Chaos yeah. going on in Russia. So uh, or not there's... Russia, yeah. Well, there is. Well. I mean, yeah, but the, <laughs> yeah. Ca- There's the, a war. The, the center of the war is Ukraine, but the bystan the, the people uh Russia's getting Russia's getting affected heavily because of obviously all these sanctions that are going on, but a side story or like one story in 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 this gigantic story, one smaller story is that all of these fast food companies announced that they were pulling out of Russia. They were out. McDonald's, Burger King, Papa John's, some other ones. They're all out, right? And then um, executing on that promise. So that was made by, I guess, the CEOs in America. Executing on that promise has proved to be almost impossible because these CEOs didn't double check any of their contracts in <laughs> Russia. And it turns out they didn't have a World War III clause with their franchisees. So they got a better lawyer. The issue is that these aren't these companies are not all owned by the CEO in, in, at McDonald's or, or let's go with Burger King for this instance uh, in, in sitting in America, in Texas, wherever they're, they're based or Florida, I believe, is not then directly in charge of the person in Russia. What Burger King made a deal with a large scale company to develop Burger King in Russia a long time ago. This is very normal that all these companies do this. And that company has now built out 800 uh, Burger Kings throughout Russia. And the Rush- and the American company said, all right, well, we announced in the news that you were closing all your stores. So, you know, time to close the stores. And the Russian company went like, wait, wait, wait what? No, like, tell us where in the contract it says we have to. So now they're in this sticking point where... The U.S. wants them to close. There is no direct way for them to close. I would like, I ran Mr. Softy in China for a decade. I have intricate knowledge of this entire industry of franchising a company in a foreign country. So I want to propose, I've read a number of articles that, and they all just come to this final conclusion that, well, there's nothing they can do about it. Being someone who's been in the middle of this, that's complete BS. There's something very easy they can do about this, and I want to propose that quickly, and then I will ask you guys. I'll, I'll present my question to you. Here's the answer. If you run Burger King in America, and you want your franchisee that runs 800 Burger Kings in Russia to close, and in the contract it doesn't say what you can, what you do is you send a team of spies to Russia and they go into your Burger Kings, I guarantee you they are not following your mm-hmm. contract, your stipulations, beat by beat, every single step of the way. I guarantee you, you can find an ice cream machine in one of those stores that has not let the ice cream sit in the freezer for eight hours. They've only let it sit for three hours. And bang, they broke your contract. You can get out of it. I've done this a hundred times to <laughs> contracts I wanted to get out of in China with franchisees, with if I wanted to fire employees. All you have to do is you just scrutinize them a little closer and you're going to find something. Nowhere in any of these articles does it say they can do this. This is within your contract and you can do it. Immediately solve the problem. Send people over there. Done. Now, the question I present to all of you, should this all matter? Should we care? Should 
the 800 Burger Kings be closed in Russia? Or is the worst thing we can do to Russians is leave them with only the impossible Whopper and they have to eat it? <laughs> I was going to say, Bur- go ahead. Wait, wait. Turner, does this mean that we could still at this point in our lives become spies, albeit yes! for Burger King? Because I would job. love to be a spy for Burger King. Like like me and Capital to get one of those old timey horse costumes and <laughs> well, clamor listen, our way into I mean, a Russian. The term they use is secret shopper, but it's not as romantic as being a spy. Yeah, yeah I like that. Yeah. You don't want to say yeah. secret shopper on a date. You want to say and you, spy. Plus, you, you're gonna have to learn a lot of like Burger King specific Russian words to be convincing. So it's gonna be a <laughs> of whole course. training. Uh, the oh, other yeah, option what? they can do, I would present, is that and this also hasn't been hasn't been mentioned anywhere in any of these articles, is go after the uh their their suppliers. So all we had a mo- n- almost none of our we had a f- couple Chinese suppliers, but most of them were either from Hong Kong or the United States or New Zealand. I'm sure it's the same with them. So you could go after them. But the real question to all of you is: Should we care? Should all these close, or is this incidental in the grand scheme of things? Anyone, go ahead, take it away. My s- my sense is that it doesn't matter. I think that politically, the companies are probably doing it to seem like, oh, we care about human rights, just like you know they send parade people you know, floats to pride parades and all the rest, right? And yes. the, the, where I go when you say this is the research on sanctions and political science. And basically, you need sanctions that hurt the leaders. And I don't think right. Putin is going to Burger King. Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> you know? Although, ironically, though, President He's Trump was going guy. to McDonald's. So That's theoretically. Just, <laughs> if it were Trump, we'd have a different story on our hands. But these are not the targeted Taco sanctions Bulls. that we're looking for. Though I don't know. The only version of the world where this would really matter is if somehow... In Russia, I mean, Turner, tell me if I'm misremembering. There were, there were moments, and maybe still are in China, where fast food restaurants are actually really popular. Or it's like, they're kind of like nice places. I remember Pizza Hut was like this fine dining event. And it kind of meant that you were you were showing off your money and you were cultured and you were, you know, urban and whatever by going to all these things. So maybe if that exists in Russia, and that's not a fair comparison, and that's not even true in China anymore, I don't think. So only if like the elite people in Russia... Or, or there's something about Russian morale that really needs these restaurants that would then imp- like have an effect on Putin's standing, then maybe. But I'm doubtful. I mean, I'll that say this: cares that much. if it were this is just comparing it to China, but if it were KFC in China, and mm. th- again they couldn't do it contractually, but if all the KFCs just closed overnight, that would cause quite the uproar. But there's yeah. thousand, I want to say five thousand KFCs in China. It's a different level. Eight hundred Burger Kings yeah. is frankly not a lot. It sounds like There's a lot of stock would go. Yeah, got to be other bur- like Burger Queen or whatever the Russian version knockoffs are. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> McDonald's. If there are any well, that's right? what that's what Burger Kings presented. They said the, all we can do, we can ask them to close. We can't force them. We can try to go to um, some of the suppliers, but it's not really. A, I mean, they haven't really mentioned that actually much at all. I, they can't even take the branding away. There's nothing they can do. They shouldn't have announced right. it. It's this classic, no. like, announce it and then go get it done. It's what politicians right. do all the time. Businesses rarely do. But here we go. I, I'm with Andrea on this one. I, I think san- sanctions in this instance make sense if you're targeting the the people at the top because they're the right people and we're just trying to piss them off. Or alternately, theoretically, if you can do it so intensely that it, it grinds the economy down to the point where it can't prosecute the war effort, then it could be efficacious. Targeting fast food chains is not going to do that unless they're a part of the supply chain to feed soldiers. But beyond that, this is just virtue signaling, and I'll tell you why. Because Russia has been kicked out of SWIFT, the international banking conglomerate, there is no means by which Burger King can take money out of Russia at this moment anyway. So them saying, we don't wish to do business with you is beside the point. They're not getting money from Russia. So they're they're saying, we we, we refuse to do business with these people that we can't actually do business with, Uh, which is one of the things that irritates me just about the internet in general. I've decided people people really want to get credit for not having to do anything. Like- uh, uh, That's America. Um, the, the, what, one of the things that I got like minor heat from last week is um, there's this now distinction between Kiev and Kiev. Oh, Kiev we, we went the, Ru- that fire. <laughs> the the Russian I've word for, the for, for, yep. for the capital of Ukraine, Kiev being the Ukrainian capital. And my position is. I say Kiev because I'm from America, and that's Kiev is the American word for the capital of Ukraine. And uh, and and the way I look at this, you can call it Kiev, and I have no problem with that. But I do think you should do that with literally every other country as well. So don't say Prague, say Praha. Don't say China, say Zhongguo. 
and and people started getting mad at you me. You got to fix your pronunciation, Heaton. I was going to say right. that's This awkward. is why I'm not trying, right? But like, yeah. but, when I, but when I say China, though, like it, like in the same way that people are, well, if you're saying Kiev, you're saying that you think it's Russian. And I'm like, when I say China, it doesn't yeah. mean that I think that China should be producing opium for the British Empire, which is why we say China, because the English were too goddamn lazy to learn how to say Zhongguo. Like, no one infers political intent from that. Um, <laughs> that was what, a great my, my, they were too busy saying Zed. They didn't have time what, what, to learn yeah, what, what I had to like, what I had to communicate to people is, look, look the, my, my problem is not the political thing. My problem is that you're not wanting to do anything other than change your minor pronunciation and then right, get credit sure. for being a good person. And to be very clear, if you can afford Netflix and you don't donate money to stuff or volunteer, you're a shitty person. So I'm not going to give you credit for just bandwagoning on wow, this Netflix, thing and charging yes. one vowel in your vocabulary. All right, Kaplan, go and, ahead. Well, I was just going to say, just as a, to close it up, it's it's just kind of sad because like the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, to me, it's like McDonald's, like opening up McDonald's in <laughs> Russia. Levi's. Oh, yeah. Levi, all that stuff. I mean, you know, that was a big deal. Like, uh, and just like, I don't think closing it, as you guys have said already, it doesn't make, it's not going to make a difference in the war. It's not going to change the war for it. It just pen penalizes Russians who work there. They're not going to rise up. You know, the same way. There's like um, a movement to like uh, tell people have to denounce Putin if they're Russian worldwide. You know, like there's a tennis yeah, player. They, they, they kicked out the like the I think it was one of the symphony uh, yeah, conductors kicked, in some Berlin or something. 20 year old symphony person that some tennis players, number one tennis player in the world. They're not going to let him play in Wimbledon if they doesn't denounce Putin. And it's like if you have family there, you know, like to put people in this position, I think is wrong, too. So I don't I think there's well, ways to win this without. Uh, yeah. With, also, yeah. more to the point, if we ever fight Russia, do you want to fight fat Russians or do you want to fight thin Russians? Now, that's I'd rather what fight I should, fat Russians. That's a, we that's should be a, opening more fast food chains over there. Yeah, You're let's right. make sure that like chopped and just salad aren't making their way over there. That's <laughs> Send them, yeah, Papa As the John's vegan, sustaining. that's what's going to make the, the difference in the war, obviously. Carl's Jr., Send right. him some Arby's. I used to work at Arby's, and I could tell you when I would eat the food Cheesecake afterwards. Cheesecake Factory? I would not be a good. You wouldn't want me fighting in your army, so. <laughs> oh, those Russians were all just full of Jamocha shakes. Jamocha <laughs> shakes, baby. <laughs> Quite an easy but, win for us. And Did I would see, like there, there to go a, be a spy. To, to, I will vault, throw my hat in the ring yeah. back to that idea. Because I, yeah, yeah, I, I know sign Burger King very up. well. Yeah. I know the menu inside and out. So Ka I can, Kaplan, Wales, I think it was in Cardiff. They canceled a... Uh, they, changed, it, it, they they had a Tchaikovsky concert that was scheduled. Uh, and, uh, and they changed it because Tchaikovsky was Russian. Right. Uh, and so they, they altered the bill. They didn't cancel it, but they took out all the military marches. Because that was too, and I'm like, guys, this is just bullshit. Like, really, like, like, Putin's not gonna go. Oh, Wales isn't listening to the uh, uh. Tchaikovsky's military. It spins out. These yeah. things spin. They always start in a good place and then spin out of control yeah. almost immediately. I mean, they All canceled the Karl Marx room in Flor in the University of Florida, and he's not even, uh, you know, he's not even Russian. <laughs> he's German. Well, I went with some friends <laughs> last week. Uh, one of my friends is Ukrainian, and she arranged for. Oh yeah, he's not my. Uh, arranged for us to go to a Ukrainian restaurant in the East Village here in New York because there's a whole bunch of Ukrainian oh, Selka, restaurants. Probably. Yeah. yeah, it was not that one, but it was near. But but it was packed, and it turns out I was reading online that there's just like an over like New Yorkers are pouring into these restaurants as a way of supporting Ukraine, and I didn't feel yeah. like it was my place to ask because I didn't organize this dinner and I wasn't gonna like not go and be pro Russia. But like, is any of this money going to Ukraine? I think this is just going to landlords in New York City, right? Again, how how can I feel great <laughs> yeah. by eating out at a restaurant? They're not even right. Ukrainian. That's... It was like it was yeah. it was founded by a Ukrainian three generations ago. Make, well, why don't you why don't you make food at your house and take the money you were going to spend and send that to humanitarian relief efforts right. going on? But they're not right. doing that. Well, and 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 I even wasted if if it did connect to Ukraine, I you I wasted Ukraine's energy by making this poor server figure out what on the menu was vegan. Like, she didn't need to do that. <laughs> I'm, like, actively hurting the war effort where she's like, well, there's cream in this and whatever. All right, Heaton, let's let's come back home. What, what news you got for us this week? Uh, I, am, I, I have been briefly looking into Florida's so-called don't mm. say gay laws. Uh, this is the newest flashpoint in the culture war. And the, uh, the sticking point here is that in, in Florida, the, the legislature and the governor have now put a law into effect that uh, teachers are forbidden to teach sexuality or sexual orientation to their students in public schools in grades kindergarten through third grade. Now, this is being interpreted by uh, the, the, the Democratic establishment as being homophobic um, and being anti-gay, that, that, uh, that Florida does not want to acknowledge homosexuality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the conservatives, meanwhile, are arguing that this is a situation where we think 
uh, sensitive topics should be introduced to children by parents rather than teachers. And I, I got it. I'm pretty much on the conservative side of this one. Like I, I, for, for the record, very, very likely that Governor Ron DeSantis did this is just really easy uh, uh, vote baiting and that it's not even an issue. And he's just doing it because he's going to run for president. And yes, I will also acknowledge the bigots who live in Florida probably prefer this. So like like noting those two things, though, the, the, the issue for me as I think about this is a guy that doesn't have kids, but will hopefully steal some at some point and, and have them under my charge, is I, I don't view education as having the point of providing a moral foundation to children. And I, I am, I'm rather bothered by the idea of looking at public education as a way to preempt backwards people from passing values onto their kids. I, I think that that's actually a legitimate concern of parents to say, I am the one in charge of the values and worldview of my child. You're in charge of teaching them how to read and do math. And if we're only talking about kindergarten through third grade, I think they got a good point. I would, I'm would. i very pro-gay. I'll probably officiate a gay wedding or be a best man at a gay wedding. The second they make a gay pill, I'll get. I'll become gay myself. Very pro-gay. <laughs> You'd but be a when very I, good gay. You're thank very you. Good. Yeah. When I steal those kids, well though, dressed. I would like to be able to the one, be able to frame it and talk to them about it. I don't. I don't want to have a kindergarten teacher explaining that. So I, I think that they've got a good point, and I think that it's it, it, right now we live in a political climate where, um, where where both sides have an incentive to to take the rhetoric and take it to the extremes and make it seem like it's a giant cataclysmic battle between two things. So my question for you is: Is this being blown out of proportion? Am I am I or or am I missing something? I got, I got, I got thoughts. So I am so glad you said all of this because this has been a very instructive moment for me. I'm gonna make this about me. Uh, for me, because I am on the left, I'm doing what the right is doing for critical race theory in this. I heard, don't say gay. Oh my God, you can't say gay in school. Oh my God, we're going back to the 90s when we all tried to cancel Ellen the first time. Ah, uh, we're freaking out. I can't believe what a fight. Oh, everyone's getting a race. It's all horrible. And as you were describing it and you said, you know, you can't say, you know, you can't teach sexuality and sexual orientation between kindergarten. And I thought you were going to say like 10th grade. And you said third grade. I didn't even know that. Right. <laughs> and I was like, oh, third grade. I didn't want to learn about sex in third grade either. The only pushback I, I, have I on can't this, find a clitoris right now. And I'm in my yeah. late 30s. Like, <laughs> yeah. you don't need to See? know about this when you're you a gotta third grader. Be gay. You got to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> A lot Make easier, that the other pill. Way. Somebody yeah. get on this. You dudes with the lab coats, please. I I heard it was the Moderna vaccine, but you know whatever. I think <laughs> the, the the two moments of hesitation I have around this are one. I think that I agree in principle with what you said about you know I don't think schools are here to teach morality or or and I think that that having parents generally guide your your their children towards moral decisions and that moral foundation all that I I don't think that's the place for schools. Just like I don't think religion is a place is belongs in schools and all of that, but I will say it can get very difficult to decide where that boundary lies because, and that's part of the critical race theory issue, is like, well, what books are you reading? What authors are you reading? If you read a gay author in third grade, I don't know how many gay authors write third grade level books, but is that gonna be a moral uh, issue? You know, and so people are gonna keep <laughs> fighting. Like I love the idea of separating it. I think in practice it's not okay. The other piece of thing th that I will say on this, and this is not my idea, this is the idea of many LGBTQIA activists on TikTok, so that's the ultimate source uh, <laughs> in the world's smartest podcast Can't wait for this one. <laughs> Here it is, is that uh, what's one thing that's been trending is they'll show videos of uh, straight families who have pictures of like their son going over to like the neighbor's house with flowers and these kids are like four and they're like, he's gonna be a heartbreaker, he's asking her out, he's the girlfriend, boy, but they have a crush on each other and they're children. And, and the point of these influencers on TikTok is that we are sexualizing children way more than we realize. We just don't have a problem with it because it's straight. And I think that's a fair point. Not that that's necessarily happening in schools, but I think that's a fair point to bring into the conversations. Anytime you hear someone say little heartbreaker, they're violating that law as well. Like DeSantis needs to pull that in. Don't say gay. Mm, don't say heartbreaker. Interesting. That's you're my you're saying ba basically try and heartbreaker. try and avoid any sexualization hey. of kids. That's I, uh, yeah. Again, I, I I'm very anti uh, child pornography. I'm the only yeah, one. Yeah, I know group, you could you, yeah. you, you you could participate in a congressional hearing to to determine uh, Supreme Court nominees. I'm, I'm running the, for little Supreme little heartbreaker. Court. Ka yeah. Kaplan, didn't you reproduce a couple times? Have, Don't you have kids? I have, what are you heartbreakers. About? I have actual yeah. attractive yeah. children, so I, I, you have to allow me to say that. How, Super how gay hot. are they? When you're yeah. not, yeah. when you're not attractive <laughs> yourself, you and your kids are good looking. You gotta, you gotta have some pride. But no, well, first off, when it, the bill said "Don't say gay," I thought it was. I thought it meant you shouldn't use the word "gay" as an insult. Like, that's what that's, I thought. 
that's what I thought this we were talking about. I was like, I 100% agree with that. Yeah. Because believe it or not, even in progressive New York City, kids here use the word gay as an insult. And I can't believe it in 2022. So I would support it if that was the law. But that is apparently not the law you're telling me. So I got to rethink it. But no, I, I have seen firsthand that, that um, not in schools, but in like... Uh, in like gymnastics classes and other places where they sort of try to start teaching some sort of sexuality things to like that young Kaplan, kids. Kaplan, tell them what ha- Tell them about the gymnastics class. Like they try to, like Explain they don't it. know any, like they don't understand anything. It's so gross. I don't even well, know what happened. I don't like it. Well, no, they, it's not sexuality. That's that's where it gets tricky though because they, they, they wait, um, wait, wait, Kaplan, you're not explaining it. Let me explain it. Kaplan's kid went to, what was it? Uh, uh it was, a. Uh, like a, a, it was it was gymnastics, but specifically for um, non-binary. No, it was gender kids, expansive. Right? They called like it, that? and then they did like a whole. They do like a whole pronoun lecture with the kids. And I'm like, my whole point is, when you're kindergarten, first grade, second grade, they don't even know. Like, so they come home and they're like saying to you, asking you questions, and you're like, but you don't even know. Like, it's like goes back to the using gay as an insult thing. Like, they don't know when they use that as an insult why it's even an insult because they don't know what it means to be gay. They don't know mm. what it means to be straight. So teaching them all this stuff, it's just going over everyone's head and then getting mad about it is also, to me, very silly because it's like, I, I don't know, like, to pa- you, I'm surprised seeing you're in favor of a law, like, because it does seem like a free speech thing, doesn't it? To, well, I so, mean, so this, it, this, you're telling a teacher how to, what, how to teach your class. So I'm, well, I think it's silly to well, teach there's them a, But also, also in school, if I can jump in here, and Andrea brought it up. Um, and I don't know where I'm, what side I'm on with all this stuff, but Andrea brought up the religion parallel. And I think there is a parallel there, unless I'm missing something. But you can't talk about religion in school, so that's also right, a free yeah. speech issue, right? Yeah, I, I, I think I think freedom of speech does not necessarily mean you can say whatever you want, wherever you want, regardless of context. It means that you're not going to be criminalized for having and expressing an opinion. That does not mean that your employer can't take action if it's inappropriate. So very pertinent example to this. Uh, I used to be a substitute teacher and, <laughs> until I was asked to not do that anymore. And uh, I, uh, I, I was yada, I was yada, yada. <laughs> I was subbing for, for, I think it was a second grade class, and, and this kid came up and he went, Mr. H? Yeah. Bobby said the C word. And I went, oh, no. Uh, kids, oh, come boy. here. Everybody gather around. Gather around, Mr. Heaton. All right. Let me explain why you should never say. And then he goes, he said crap. <laughs> and I go, oh. Uh, whoops. Oh, yeah. Don't 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 say crap. But I was real. I, I was I was preparing in my head a lecture, but like, kids, you shouldn't say crap. Unless it's you're bad, like I was, I was like very. I'll bleep that, Eric. We're gonna bleep that. In Australia, any, yeah. But <laughs> literally, like, like, but I would have gotten fired, and probably rightly so, right? Hang like, on, like, Heaton, the, how yeah. are you saying Zed, but you're, you're not still, saying the British c word? What's I do, just not in classrooms. I just uh, did on the podcast. But if I, but if, <laughs> if, if if somebody invites me to talk to their third graders, I'll I'll say something else instead. So no, I, I think Ka- Kaplan. The way I'm looking at this, like the, the best counter argument. I shouldn't say counter argument because I've not had this posited to me by any of my friends. But I my if I'm getting in their shoes, I think a lot of people would say that um, it, it it makes sense for the state to uh, instruct children on something that society largely agrees on, like, you know, racism's bad or something like that, uh, and, and therefore this is appropriate. And my my problem with that is that um, you, can't, you can't just go, laws are going to exist, but only when they favor my opinion. They don't work that way. So like, if, if you say like, well, we believe the state should be able to instruct children in the proper way to regard genders, you're also saying that when Republicans are in charge, they get to go, by the way, kids, there's only two genders. Uh, or alternately, um, you know, kids, we know that homosexuality is a form of deviation or whatever the thing is. Uh, and so these laws exist largely as a kind of ideological truce to say that children are going to be taught reading, writing, and arithmetic in school, and we're going to leave the the sticky things to their parents because we'd rather not have a football going back depending on who has the authority at the time. No, I was just going to say that in the schools here, just from my experience, they do, like, they'll read, they'll read, like, a book, like, Heather Has Two Moms or whatever the book is or something. And then, which is, but it's, I, so I guess that would be illegal, right, in this way this law is, like, that type of book? Because it's explaining, I mean, it's, there are yeah, children it, obviously it, here it, it who have. Two moms. This would be if it were taught if it were taught before the age of uh, third grade, it would be illegal because you're you are trying to explain to kids how. And for the record, come over to Uncle Heaton's house and we'll read it and we'll so hang great. out with my gay friends. You're, like you're into, I'm very much in favor of this, but I understand why we moms. don't want to have this be the football but in the school itself. This is where it goes back to the TikTok influencers because all roads lead here in the end <laughs> yeah, anyway. Which is they, to say that if I read a book that says Susan goes to the store with her mom and dad and I'm in right. second grade. That's also, 
about relationships and sexuality uh, and how parents work. And so well, the and objection every, is a very specific kind of family. And so it is assuming that it's the normal state, even by just saying, yeah, it's okay to talk about heterosexual couples and it's okay to talk about white people and black people as long as we don't talk about injustice against them. But then right? you'll have And I'm with you. I don't, I don't want to force kids to grapple with yeah. all these horrible things the rest of us have to think about any sooner than, than we have to. But I... I mean, I don't have a good answer for this either. Here, yeah, I Turner, actually, I mean, that, that is, that is a great point. I have an answer here. Yeah. Yeah, here's my yeah. answer. All right, um, here's, what the, here's the lesson out of all this. Whoever names the law wins. <laughs> that's you <true>. know. <laughs> yeah. So whoever gets there first, all these politicians, and I'm sure they do, but they should be racing that any time a thing gets, it's the same, it's, it's the classic like pro-life versus uh, pro-choice, right? We're talking about the exact same thing, but depending upon what, what what you hear then you're like of course that i'm right and the other side's wrong of course i want people to live who wants people to die and then the other side's like but should women have a choice of course they should have a choice and it's the same don't say gay i didn't know what it meant i assumed first it went with kaplan thing and then when i heard it was i heard it was anti-gay at my church because they were like we need to we need to be we're against this we got to be against this law Progressive church because it's anti-gay and so i'm like oh it must mean in the whole in the fl whole state of florida no one's allowed to say the word gay that's what i thought it was right so I yeah. thought and then i'm like oh it's third grade um, so yeah, you know, no, no child left behind. You want to leave kids behind, asshole? Yeah. You don't want to leave I mean, kids behind. But the then Freedom like, Act. How about the Freedom Act? Yeah, that no, was the third grade thing is the key because, like, I've heard like kids say, like a first grader, second grader say, oh, like two girls will say, like, we want to get married. Like, I want to marry my best friend. It's like they don't understand. Like, it's not they're not yeah, being they progressive. Know. They're not being anything. They just like they like that. Like, they know you're allowed to. It's gonna in a few years from now they'll. Obviously, this, this is not going to affect them at all. So, well, it's, someone uh, hasn't read the New York Times yeah. piece about platonic same-sex marriages that's been going on because it turns out that for legal benefits, you can marry your same-sex best friend nice. and have them be there to carry out your end-of-life things. And I, I still got Adam a Sandler shot movie, if I don't find it? that clitoris. So I can still maybe yes, slip just, in the back of marriage. Your friend. All right, Kaplan, bring us home. What news you got for us this well, time? Well, you know, last time on our roundtable, we came up with the ingenious idea of taking Epstein Island and selling it, making it for the Olympics. Uh, That's right. Making it the, yes. the official oh, permanent home of the Olympics. Permanent home yeah. of the Olympics. <laughs> well, some brainiacs came up with an even better idea that I, I don't even understand it. So I just want to throw it out there, and then hopefully our brains can, can explain it to me and see if this is – because this could be an idea for the Olympics. It could be an idea for something else. But it's an, the idea is to privatize the moon, to wipe out poverty. Economists – Privatizing the moon is the next great idea to wipe out poverty on Earth, they say, um, because they would divide, they would basically have a satellite that would divide parcels of land to different countries who would then rent it out for businesses. And then I, I don't even understand that, like how this would work, but I love the idea. Like I love the like, <laughs> like it just sounds like it, it, it to me, it sounds like what we should be doing instead of us like going up into space like Tesla guy, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, they just fly up and they come back and they, they charge somebody a lot of money. Like, why are we not going to our, our weekend home in the moon? Like, what, what, why are we not? Because it, it, they just, but how would Wait, this Wait, so work? how is this helping poverty? That's what I was trying to figure out. I'm reading the article. <laughs> I think it just would, it creates more jobs because there's more places to go. There's another, it's like vacations, you know, like tourism industry. <laughs> is, or Kaplan, and this is a question for you. You're, you're the, you've read the article, but is it that um, if they, whatever money is generated on the moon would go to homeless? Is that the idea? No, it just would go to the countries that own. The <laughs> <laughs> it's essentially like it would help with the debt, I think. Like you'd have more a avenues. Like as a country, you were like, oh, we also have the moon. We also have like this sounds like when Trump wanted to buy Greenland. And you're like, what? How can we do that? Can I ask a stupid question? Because I, you guys are all smarter than me. If everyone, is it possible to wipe out homeless ever? <laughs> because if everyone in the world has more money, then... Doesn't everyone just kind of have the same amount of money? You gotta pass along. No. You gotta pass me the, the everything joint. costs. Pass more. me the bong so the, the, if you're gonna say it that way. Like, the, there's a specific economic term which escapes me at the moment, but there's basically like things that are scarce because I I want them to have I want to have them, but I don't want other people to have them. Arguably, PhDs operate that way. Where like if everybody got a PhD, we'd have to create a new super PhD because it's showing that I'm smarter than the people below me. Um, th things Thanks for like, making me feel bad that I don't have a super <laughs> PhD. I'm gonna go. But you outrank all of us, right? Yeah. Um, For now. So that there, there are things like that, like th th things which things in which the value is determined by other people not having it cannot be uh, universally allocated. It would be impossible, right? I really but want that, to know the word for that. But, Maybe but that, one of your listeners that, knows. 
Yeah, f- feel free. Uh, uh, some I guarantee you, somebody is going to put this on the Patreon, uh, the Patreon notes. And I thank not you to in say advance. the Lost in America listeners wouldn't know, but I feel like <laughs> well, he's listening. Our listeners who also um, listen to Heaton would know. Maybe. Yeah, okay. uh, yes. uh, that's right. Yeah, we got some overlap. Heads. Uh, but 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 in, but in terms of actual just material resources, like right now, we have enough food in the world for everybody not to starve. Right now, we have enough housing in the world for everybody not to be homeless. So so it, like like it, it's not a material problem. It, it's a logistical and economic problem. Uh, now the ability for everybody to have a nice house house or an enviable house or a house that would be in a, you know, in, in country living or whatever, that's not going to happen because the, the, you're still going to have status and you can't allocate status, but you can't allocate resources. But should we, should we send the homeless to the moon though? Is that what we're thinking? Is that the move? Or, or I mean, like the way they we, sent the if, prisoners to Australia or should this, we, this <laughs> sounds like a great science fiction film <laughs> uh, that I would definitely watch called like lunar hobo or like, like yeah. moon tramp or something. And they form. I mean, that's kind of, have, you, have you ever read uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, uh, Mistress, Kaplan? I mean, obviously, you know the answer to that. No. Great <laughs> book by Robert Heinlein. And it's sort of like the moon is kind of like the, the slush, the slush fund for poor people that they all just move up there and they just kind of like live in tunnels. And they grow, uh, they, they, they grow, uh, I think it's like uh, mushrooms or, or farm. They farm soy and stuff and send it back to earth. But it's sort of like this. You can, and then eventually they go like, hey, we should just be our own country. Like why are we why, why yeah. are we doing this? They sort of they, they start flinging they literally catapult catapult rocks at Earth until like Earth is like fine you're your own country, um, yeah. But then yeah, that's we- where that's going to end up. Here's my question for you all, Cap and Cap in particular. But it's here. So Turner, I have a, a dumb question as well, which is or like a basic question, which is I have never understood the whole thing about we need like, it sounds like the whole argument is like, we could make even more money if we also had businesses on the moon, right? Like we make a lot of money here in general in the world. And when we go to places like China that previously didn't have a lot of these companies and now we have them, we make a lot more money and everyone gets really excited. And it's like, none of us have smart goals here. We don't have like a, this is success. We just keep saying we want more money. And well, so we just let go me, to the moon can, and just the number, the GDP number Well, they goes say up, like, property no, rights. No, no, no. Wait, let me, let me yeah, jump in me. here. So the reason why China, because I, I, as I said, I ran a business in China. The reason why China was attractive is because they had 300 million people in the middle class mm. that had just become middle class. So all of a sudden there was a country that was the, essentially the size of the United States, 300 million, that all now could afford to buy your ice cream or your hamburger or whatever. The moon has zero population. So I don't think that, <laughs> Good that point. I wouldn't I wouldn't co- correlate those two. Well, they're talking I, about I'm reading a yeah. quote where they say property rights play a key role in boosting living standards and dignity. So like I guess this must be written by someone who it's lives so in like weird. New York or San Francisco who like thinks like it's so expensive to own you can't own just go to the moon. I think wasn't like, wasn't this this is by a think tank isn't it? My, yeah, my like, guess is it's like Niskanen the or something. Right, like you could just go to uh, Kansas or somewhere. Or like, oh, buy well, hold, hold on. So it's 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 by the Adam Smith Institute. Yes, who oh, are probably boy. good good stalwart free market neoliberals, neoliberals like me. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so they're they're letting. I I need to I need to read this because I I don't yeah. actually know what their claim. I I, th- I think that this is basically a thought experiment to indicate to those of us who currently live on Earth that markets and private property work really well. Uh, I don't know what their actual long term goal is. However, if I might go on a weird atavistic economic rant for a moment, please should please. we should we have the opportunity to build a new society on a different body, which we would have to adjust international law for, incidentally, because right now under international law to which the United States is uh, is a signatory. Um, you can't own private property in space. The the moon is not owned by any any country right. nor have to individual. This. Yeah, we, we'd have to change this. Yeah, because like one of one of the first things America did when we went up, we put a flag on it, and we were like, by the way, we, we're not claiming this. Like this is not like the Earth is not American property. It's not just North Wyoming. It's just the only cloth we had with it's kind of an accent. Yeah. We wanted to put something there. It just happened to be yeah, we, well, we, we were like, if we ever form a music television channel, we'll need some kind of cool <laughs> logo. So we we would have to we'd have to adjust that. That being said, though, uh, there used to be this group called Georgists. And I think they were I think they were on the ball. I think that they sh- that's we should have done that. Right. So Georgists uh, were of the opinion that. Uh, the taxes should not be based on income. It should be based on the the value of the land underneath us, right? Um, so to kind of make a, a division here, basically like you are not charged taxes based on how much money you make. 
nor on on how, like the fact that you built a building. You're you're charged taxes based on the land underneath it that you don't have anything to do with. So like if if you have land near a subway stop, well that's not really on you. You didn't build it. So we're going to charge you more than someone far away from the subway stop. But if you build a skyscraper, hey, good for you. We're not going to charge you more for the excess rooms or whatever. And if and if you've got like if you've got land on top of massive oil reserves, we're we're going to charge you more for those oil reserves because you didn't have anything to do with it. And that's going to go into the state coffers. But if you build a car factory or whatever and it's doing gangbusters, like we're not going to take money from you for that. Good for you on that. Keep all that money. That's fine. We're going to take money from things that are are sort of like the, the property of the whole country as opposed to the labor. Or to, Yeah, that's a better way of putting it. Your labor is yours. We're not going to take any of that. But we are going to take things that are are – natural, given by God, or created by circumstance beyond your control. And the moon would be a good opportunity to do that kind of thing, I think. I would say, I think that we should privatize the moon, but only as if we do, only if we say, this land is now California, but it was once occupied by Buzz Aldridge, <laughs> and we need to honor yes. the land of our forefathers. I speak to you from... I think yeah. that's right. I think we also need to update international law, so or at least Burger King should be smart about how they set up their franchises out there to have the power to cancel them when the war breaks out in the moon. on the moon. Well, what Putin right? invade the, the moon? Oh, on the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Good luck getting rewrite. any money out of that franchisee if that's yeah. the way to yeah. write a contract. How many countries what have been to the moon so far? It's probably a dollar. It might be Bitcoin. I don't it's know us. that anybody's Definitely Bitcoin. landed on the moon other than us. Have really? The Russians I, I know that like, China the f- f- uh, flung a rocket at Didn't it. The India Russians threw the moon? a rocket at it. Who sent the animals no? up? Wasn't there a dog that got sent or did I make that up? I think the Russians. Um, they killed the a Russians. Bunch. We talked about that on yeah, this podcast. Yeah, put a bunch of dogs did in we? space. <laughs> oh, and they got, it got blown up though. They the killed a bunch died. of dogs in space. Oh, yeah. Jesus. I, I've so, told yeah. you guys my favorite That's conspiracy still the worst theory thing about the landing, right? We only killed a school teacher. Yeah. We already have too many of those. All right. Yeah. He, yeah. What said, you, she, what's she your... Didn't believe did, did, I, I, if I told you, my, this is my favorite, all-time favorite conspiracy theory. So you, you know the conspiracy theory that the moon landing was a hoax and that it was done by Stanley Kubrick and all that. So I, I love this theory because everybody wins. We went to the moon. Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and the coward that stayed in the ship, right. they all went to the moon <laughs> and they came back. That's all legitimate. Buzz Aldrin is totally justified in punching a guy that questioned it. But on the way back... They didn't realize that cosmic rays from the sun would screw up all of the film footage. So it was completely blank by the time we got here. <laughs> and then we paid Stanley Kubrick to fake it. Wow. So everybody's right. Stanley Kubrick faked it and we went to the moon. And this everybody's is, a winner. That's like when we do a really good podcast. Smartest podcast network. That yeah. mm-hmm. you just solved a huge problem. What a way to end it. I think yeah. that's it. I think well, that's, that's like when we record a really good podcast and forget to press record. That's the exact same feeling you have. <laughs> yeah, I hope yeah, someone yeah. press record. All right, yeah. Keaton, for Let, the next let's round plug table, our shows. I want I want uh, other conspiracy theories. I want JFK 9/11 nice. uh, and vaccines the solved. All right, let's plug our shows. Uh Turner mm-hmm. Cap, what do you what do you guys got? We are uh, lost in America. We talk to comedians every single week around the world about the global news events happening in their country. Think of this. You're getting your global news instead of from the big networks, mm. from, the com- from a comedian who actually is from the country and lives in the country where the news is happening. We've been talking a lot recently to Misha Kalin, who is broadcasting from the 18th floor of his apartment in Kiev because Kiev. I'm not a... I'm not a Russian, Keaton, so I pronounce it one. I, and I've been doing <laughs> and, that my whole life. And you said Keaton, which is my Russian name. I know. I'm really, no, no, really offended. It's, it's Heaton Keith. in Ukraine, but it's Keaton when I'm in Moscow. <laughs> Heaton also, I should say, I will be in Australia for the next three weeks doing comedy in Melbourne and Sydney to anyone who's there. And Kaplan, I don't know, are you still selling Girl Scout cookies or where are we? <laughs> we're still, this Monday we'll be selling the <laughs> final. People Scout cookies. If you're in New York City, come outside. Player. We'll be selling them outside. So. But uh, oh, okay, find cool. me at Cap in America on all social media. Heaton, what do you got? Uh, I am Andrew Heaton or Keaton when I'm in uh, Moscow, (laughs) and I am the host of The Political Orphanage. The Political Orphanage is a respite for people who are tired of red team versus blue team shenanigans. If you have watched any of the SCOTUS hearing with Judge Jackson and your blood started boiling because you could see the naked partisan hysterics and you just wanted to figure out what was actually going on, perhaps you will find a home in The Political Orphanage. I recently did a special on international relations theory, which sounds boring, but really it's the DNA of war and figuring out where war comes from and how best to avert it. So I, 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 I toss that to you. And as a final incentive, I am the maximum level of funny you can be as a pundit, 
before you become a full-time stand-up comedian. I'm not funny enough to be a full-time stand-up comedian like Turner. I wish I was. But one ring below that, I'm as funny as you could get while being a full-time pundit. So I'm like an amphibian in that regard and invite you to listen to The Political Orphanage. It's a simple optimization And I'm going to just say, yeah. you are. We tour together all over, the, over Texas and Oklahoma. You, you are oh. funny. You're just too busy. You got too much going on with Thanks, your Thanks, man. All right, well, I will say, uh, Heaton, I haven't listened to your episode, but I can't wait to because international relations theory is my favorite uh, part of political science and one of my favorite parts of science, and it's why I got into my PhD program. And Turner and Cap, uh, especially to, for people listening, if you haven't already listened to Lost in America, your Ukraine coverage has been awesome. I try to tune in whenever you do it live on Twitch, and it's fantastic. Oh, yeah, All Twitch, your coverage is great, you. but I've particularly enjoyed that. Thanks. Well, enjoyed is not the right word, but you know. Uh, found yes. it valuable. So my name is Andrea Jones, or I host Majoring in Everything. It's a show about people who don't specialize in one thing. So people like Andrew Heaton, who can't seem to commit to comedy or punditry. And we talk about what it's like to be uh, masters of none, but better than people who are boring and pick one thing and all that good stuff. Uh, and we have an episode coming out with neuroscientist, flautist, and open water swimmer, uh, Paula Croxon, coming out very soon. Wow. Uh, <laughs> which is cool. So, uh... That's it. That's our that's our round table. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you. Bye everybody. Thanks. Bye. We nailed it. And that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Majoring in Everything. I'm your host Andrea Jones-Roy and Majoring in Everything is a proud member of the World's Smartest Podcast Network. Be sure to check out worldsmartestpodcastnetwork.com and our partner shows. We are edited by Eric P. Stipe who says that I need an outro, so I'm making one. Eric, does this count? Are you happy? I hope so. Thanks again for listening. Keep majoring in everything. Bye.